Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. One of the most repeated scenes captured at Kamiak Butte is deer walking and eating. We capture these through our camera trap points and in all times of the year. At Kamiak Butte, we see both mule deer, Oricolius hemionis, variety hemionis, and their ancestral niche partners, white tailed deer, Oricolius virginianus. Today, I will take you for a stroll into the issue of birthing fawns within this butte located in the western interior woodlands and shrublands biome. I challenge you to consider the commonly known stereotypes we believe and understand about these deer. Keep watching the date shown on these videos, year, month, day, and time. I put them all into chronological order as we travel. We have a unique opportunity at Kamiak Butte County Park because we have both deer species, plus other ungulates like Rocky Mountain Elk, Cervus canadensis nelsoni, and Shirasi moose, Alsus alsus Shirasi. Our stroll investigates several issues we can observe and analyze. I begin by looking not only at the birthing event, but further back, as we consider the autumn breeding season. This is seen as doe deer enter estrus, and the bucks in sink enter the rut. We will consider these events and causes to bring them about. Keep your mind attuned to the biological events which cause estrus to begin as a response within this restrictive environment. Watch and consider how deer of different species developed their population-specific strategies. Back up the calendar to consider when breeding happens. Breeding is timed to occur when adequate nutrition is available for mothers and offspring following birth. Because the diet of deer is 100% plant-based, fawns are typically born in the spring when lush vegetation is high in nutrients. We examined weather and climate, looking specifically at times when the minimum temperature within the most recent 24 hours was above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius, and moisture was available allowing plant photosynthesis. This is when plants start to grow. It is also when the ungulates begin to give birth. Timing is critical. This ensures that enough food is available for the doe to produce milk for the fawn and thus increases the chances of survival. For this to happen, deer have been conditioned to back up the calendar to use the day length to determine when breeding should occur. Hmm. Both white-tailed deer and mule deer are short day breeders. Breeding occurs in the fall when day length is declining. This generally does not happen on the shortest daylight period of the year. And it happens before that, oftentimes weeks before the shortest daylight day. How do these deer calculate that? Well, when daylight is decreasing, increased melatonin is released from the penile gland in the brain. This starts a cascade of hormonal events that induce estrus in does and the rut in males. This is the signal for the reproductive system to awaken and breeding to begin. Doe deer are polyesterous, meaning they can come into heat multiple times within the breeding season, usually in 28-day intervals. This mechanism increases the chances that the species with superior genetics survives another year. If the doe does not conceive in her first heat, she will then cycle 28 days later to offer another opportunity to become pregnant. Teleport to 10 October 2021 on the south-facing aspect. This family group of doe deer are traversing the butte as a loosely grouped band of doe deer. Of course, they are eating as they walk. They all seem to eat on the walk. Look at the lead doe deer. She is sniffing and holds her tail high. She is spreading some pheromones to announce that she has entered estrus. The other doe deer on the swalk are sniffing as well. This is early in the morning, just about 0745 hours. This is not a search only for food.
We come back to the same site about 20 minutes later. During this time of year, does often visit scrapes, a cleared area on the forest floor made by a male deer during breeding season. Does release pheromones, and glands in their hind legs also release scent. This allows the buck to find the doe and breed. The lead doe deer comes back to sniff this interesting sight, and she follows the smell of pheromones. Watch her sniff the place where a predecessor dropped some odors. It might have been a doe, and our guide masks it over with more of her own. She lifts her tail to spread her special and fresh smell. She sniffs the air and keeps her head held high, looking for a mate. This odor might have been made by a buck who also smelled the previous doe. He marked this location to claim his presence on this site. At the same site almost a month later, and this seems to be a different doe deer. Ah, there is the scent follower. This is a young buck who picked up on the pheromone lead. He has spike antlers, leading me to believe he is in his first mature year of breeding. His jaws are open, and he breathes hard. Here he comes, and there she is. Reproductive cycles are genetically engineered by native species as they develop adaptive responses to their restrictive environments. Each gene change delivering host advantages will be passed from one generation to the next. Do that successfully and your species, which reproduces annually, will realize benefits annually, within a quinquennium, a decade, or hundreds of years. This marks the metapopulation species benefits. We are watching a band of doe deer with our attention on this closest one. Look behind her. There is another doe. Look behind her and see how she is spreading her pheromones to mark her presence. She is in estrus too, and this is the end of October. This white-tailed doe deer is in estrus, and this is the beginning of November. She sees the infrared camera light and looks intently at it. You can even see her eyes reflected in the camera lens. <laughs> wow, this is interesting, but she walks to a spot where scent is laid out. She marks it with some more of her own. She walks to spread scent from the four interdigital glands between the toes of each hoof. The gland is a small sac that exudes cheesy, yellowish fluid with an odor like uh, sour milk. Do you think that odor attracts anyone? Huh. <laughs> It attracted what looks like another doe, but this nighttime vision, I would miss a spike antler. That deer's performance does not look like it is seeking a mating event. This deer is different. He comes only a few minutes later. Take a good look at the calendar. This is the beginning of November, and if this mating event is successful, she will gestate for 201 days. Count those days and she will give birth on Tuesday, 24 May 2022. Of course, based on the calendar, I assume she missed her first estrus cycle, or maybe this is her first attempt this year. We will see if she carries after this attempt. 21 November, and this doe is in estrus. She evidently missed the mating success marker and came in heat again. I roll this scenery back a year to see this white-tailed deer fawn on the same sites. Those spots are beginning to fade and obviously they are amble. Exploration is easy for this little one, even without its mother. Still back to the summer of 2021, and we see mule deer and white-tailed deer on the same site and within a week of each other. They are not avoiding each other. They are not getting together either. They just exist in the same community. 
These fawns are all about two months old, and they are browsing on green bushes. Much changed in the lives of these deer from the changing of daylight in the fall and their melatonin surges, the estrus cycles, rutting, and then entry of winter. In the spring, we found some great moisture levels to sprout green meals. Consider the different approaches to raising these fawns. We saw mule deer mothers with the fawns every day and night walking together, exploring, and never really separating for long. They take an active role in the early weeks of the fawns' lives. White-tailed deer have a different approach and did not frequent the camera trap areas we used. We did not see a lot of white-tailed deer doe activity when their fawns were building their legs. They took their mothering activities to a different, less visible arena. Their approach is not bad. It is just different than the scenes we captured. These ungulates sprang to life, and we watched as mule deer mothers took their matriarchal role to teach movement, silence, listening, and comfortable independence. Singles, twins, and triplets all captured the flavor of life.